Now another interesting feature of this study is that it included a uh, withdrawal stage. And we talked about withdrawal designs on uh, Wednesday, I think it was. So what do you think that's going to involve if there's a withdrawal element at some point in this design? <coughs> withdraw the reward, extend the period of time, uh, well, you've already increased the length of time required to earn a reward and then get to a certain intensity of exercise, fitness, whatever your management was, and then to begin to withdraw the reward, but the, hopefully the, the, the becomes self-rewarding and intrinsic. Yeah, yeah, so the, the key aspect of any withdrawal design is that you're taking the treatment away. So remember, we saw this early on. We had the uh, the ABA design, where there's the treatment A. Uh, well, actually, no. Sorry, the baseline is A. The treatment is B, and then they take the treatment away, and then that's called the withdrawal stage. And so they would stop giving the rewards at one point in the study to see what would happen with the kid's behavior. So. Let's stop talking about this and go ahead and look at our results here. Now, we have the initial baseline phase where the kids are uh, given the opportunity to ride the bike. So they, they ride the stationary bike and they exercise, uh, but the reward system isn't actually in place at this point. And these are our two uh, participants who don't actually have a weight problem. They're not really in shape, but they're just not obese. And as you can see, they uh, start off and they have different baselines, just like we've seen in some of these other small end designs, because everybody's a little bit different. Right? And then, according to the baseline, uh, that's uh, going to determine the level of the re reward starting out. Right? And so, with this first participant, you can see their baseline for number of revolutions per minute on the bike was between about 60 and 75 there. And so they set a baseline that uh, these folks had to reach, or th not these folks, but this particular individual, Scott here, had to reach uh, about 75 in order to get a reward. And so after that was set, you saw a clear increase in uh, the revolutions per minute. But then it started to level off. And so they increased the required RPMs to get a reward. And so then you saw another gradual increase, and then they increased it again. And here we see the withdrawal phase. So they stopped providing any rewards. And this isn't too uh, encouraging. It looks like without rewards, uh, the children stop exercising with as much intensity. It just kind of drops back off. But then if you bring it back, then they go right back up to their initial level. So it's not like they're getting out of shape during this brief phase. But as long as they're getting the rewards, they keep on working and keep increasing their fitness. And you see a very similar pattern down here. Right? So um, there's a slight difference in the initial treatment because of this difference in the baseline. This person started off pedaling a little bit harder, more RPMs. And so they had a higher criterion. Remember, this is called the changing criterion design, because they have to reach these different levels in order to get a reward. But uh, a very similar pattern here. The criterion for getting a reward increases with time and with the performance of the participant. So they just get more, uh, basically more and more fit. They reach a higher and higher intensity. And so those are the two uh, non-obese patients, uh, but of course they want to see if this works for the uh, obese patients as well. And so uh, you can again see a very similar pattern. I'm not going to talk too much about this just because um, it looks almost identical in every single subject where there is this uh, baseline, they give the initial criterion, and you see an increase in intensity and then that goes up and up, but they drop back down without the reinforcements. And so it looks like for these folks, uh, they're, they're not really getting to that point where they become uh, intrinsically motivated, like you were saying, to exercise. And that, that can be the big challenge when you're trying to get people to do one of these exercise regimens, is to do it for themselves, do it because it makes them feel good. Uh, 
So these folks were pretty dependent on their rewards. Right? So any questions about that one? All right. So uh, there are actually a couple of uh, additional types of small end designs, but I wasn't sure we'd have time to cover them all in class. There's uh, one that I think is called an uh, ABAA1 design, for example, that looks at placebo treatments. Uh, so I just want you to read these over in your book. It's a relatively <coughs> short uh, little blurb on it, but I think that you all are uh, totally capable of reading about this on your own if you haven't done so already. And uh, you know, just take some notes over it. And if you have any questions about those designs, then we can discuss them briefly at the beginning of class on Monday. But anyway, a little homework for you. So now I just want to change gears since we've gone through a lot of these single subject designs and uh, we'll talk about how we can evaluate these for a minute. Now, one of the biggest advantages of, the, uh, of these small n and single subject designs is that you get a really high degree of that single subject validity that you don't really get with these uh, typical large designs like you'd see in a factorial large end designs. And uh, does anybody remember what this means to say that your study has single subject validity? Whatever goal you were aiming for, you measured that Uh, yeah, well, that, that's partially right, yeah, so uh, it's, it's about accuracy, I mean, validity is all about whether you're truly measuring what you think you're measuring, right? Uh, but uh, we haven't really addressed the single subject part of that. Oh, that it really has the subject or Yeah, well, it's that you're able to say that what you found is true for a single individual, right? Because you've got their data right there, just like we've seen in all these examples. There's no disputing that this is the pattern of behavior that you can actually observe in individual people. So we talked uh, on Monday about the, that issue that you can run into with large end designs, where you might see something that looks like gradual learning if you're studying a group of students, but that's because you're looking at the average of behavior of a lot of different students who learn at different rates. When if you look at an individual student, they'll go through this quick burst of learning. So instead of a slow gradual curve of learning a concept, they go pretty quickly from not understanding it to grasping it and getting a lot of correct answers. Right, so um, doing these single subject and small end designs is really the only way to get that type of validity. And one thing that can be kind of a drawback, though, is the external validity <coughs> issues. And I know that you all know what external validity involves, but anybody want to help me out here? Um, whether or not you can generalize the individual's performance or whether you're measuring uh, how well you can generalize. Right, yeah, external validity is all about generalizability. So you, you can certainly say that it's true for the, what you found is true for those people because you've got the data right there in front of you. But because you've only got one subject or maybe three subjects, you really can't say that this is true for the entire population. Uh, whenever you want to do studies that have a high degree of generalizability, it really helps out to get a very large sample. Because um, if you have a large sample of, say, a thousand people, then you can say that on average, this seems to be true for the population, as long as it's a representative random sample. Uh, so what's true for one or two individuals isn't necessarily true for everyone. Now, uh, another thing I mentioned earlier is this issue of the way that the data from these studies is analyzed. And it is possible to use some inferential and descriptive statistics on 
these data, like the stuff that you've seen on these graphs today. But um, that isn't always the case, and it isn't always done. A lot of times, uh, the researchers do rely on that kind of rough visual inspection, which uh, does kind of turn some people off. If you're a researcher who relies mainly on inferential statistics and hypothesis testing and things like that, uh, then you're going to think that these research designs are kind of weird. Uh, why would you want to look at one single person that doesn't seem very rigorous? Go out and get a sample. You know, that's, um, <laughs> that's what I tended to think after I was trained as a social psychologist because we look usually at large samples. <coughs> so I would see these uh, designs like in school psychology where they're trying out these therapies and it just seems so foreign to me. It's like, really? You've got a sample of three? I had 300 in my dissertation. What's, what's wrong with you? Why'd you do that? But uh, anyway, you can see why you might want to do that uh, according to all the things we've said in this chapter. Um, <clears throat> another thing that's kind of a drawback to the small end designs is that it's really kind of difficult to look uh, for interactions. So, of course, this involves <coughs> having uh, two or more independent variables that interact with one another. So. <coughs> If you had, say, multiple different treatments that might interact with one another, uh, that could be useful to know. Uh, but if you're looking at one person, it can be hard to make those conclusions. So what, uh, let me just ask you, what type of design tends to work really well if you want to test for interactions? Yeah, factorials. Remember, those those are the designs that have at least two independent variables. And then uh, we went through umpteen examples on how to determine whether you have main effects or interactions. And so with the because you have two or more independent variables, you can look for interactions between those. Right. So uh, let's see. Then one other common criticism of the small end designs here is an over-reliance on the rate of response as the dependent variable. So most of these studies <coughs> will look at the frequency of behavior. And you've seen that across uh, all these examples today. They're looking at how often the football players correctly did the reads, drops, and tackles, uh, how often the drool puddles accumulated, um, and things like that. So there's really a focus on the quantity of behavior rather than any type of qualitative analysis. And so that's, that can be kind of a trade-off with these. Although it would certainly be possible to focus on the quality, be, quality of behavior and quantify that in some way. Uh, but this, again, is just something that you see really commonly in this behavioral research is how often is the behavior being performed rather than how well is it being performed. So any questions about those? <coughs>